Hello and welcome to the seventh. Yes, I wrote it down and everything. <laughs> I, I doubted myself for a moment. Welcome to the seventh episode of the DMs Book Club, a podcast where we were, uh, read some Dungeons and Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role playing campaigns. My name is Fiona, and with me, as ever, the person who definitely can count is Ryan. <laughs> Ryan. I can count all the way to seven when wow. asked 50% of the time. Excellent. I don't even know what 50 is. It's above seven. It, it's lots I, of sevens. You just go seven, 50, done. That's it. Like, yeah. you, don't, you don't need any more numbers. Pretty How are much you? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, really, really good. Yeah, enjoying this. We, we've suddenly got a bit of good weather, which is really, really nice. I know. Yeah, we, I was out exercising today and me and my flatmate go out boxing before our recordings, which I know sounds very pretentious of me. Someone stopped <laughs> us boxing to give Ben tips on how to box. Oh, it, wow. It was really funny because the man who stopped us was incredibly weedy and oh, had a very, no. a very clean, it was a heavy smoke for several years. So I, obviously I was like, oh, wow. Someone is mansplaining boxing to Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I was in awe. It was incredible. That's amazing. Mm. They were just totally unprovoked. They wandered off yeah, so, the street, or were well, you doing no, so, it really publicly? Like, well, did you so have we, fanfare we're doing, and music? Oh, and... I wish. Oh, I wish we had music. That'd be great. No, so we so we sort of box in a little park near us, uh, but it's like down a sort of side of a canal in the shade, so people can see us, and it's a dead end. This guy was like across the canal, and I spotted him because I saw his dog. So instead, I was like, oh, a dog. And and then I saw him disappear, and then he just was just suddenly behind us, and we stopped. <laughs> saying, and we stopped because obviously we assumed he was trying to get through. And he goes, "Oh no, I just wanted to give you some advice on your technique." <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that your technique was so good that he was like, "There's nothing I can do here." I, I no no I th- I think it's the opposite way. I think it was just no hope for me. But Ben, maybe he could save Ben. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Maybe. So what are we reading this week, Brian? What are we discussing? Well, I decided it would be good to annoy you by picking yep. little bits of multiple books around a sort of theme. We, we've been talking a little bit about our favorite monsters and our favorite ways of putting them into campaigns. And we flirted around with some quite powerful ideas. Mm-hmm. And it got me thinking about something I saw a little while ago when... D&D Beyond released a lot of his stats about what characters people were making. Um, Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a tool. Anybody can go online, make a character of any level, and people have everything from characters that they use in campaigns and have been doing for some time that they level up and they keep all the equipment on, all the way through to I'm bored, let's make a random character, or let's experiment with character ideas to see what level progression looks like. And it was really, really interesting because apart from a couple of spikes on level one and level 20, where people are literally just making a first character, and then also people get bored and want to make a maximum level character, the vast majority of people made characters between, I think it's about level three and level seven. Mm -hmm. That was a golden range. And it was something crazy, like 50 to 60% of all characters were in that range band. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking, wow, a lot of people really, really enjoy playing D&D of a lower level, and I guess it's because it's easier, maybe conceptually to get your head around it. Characters have less skills, the abilities they've got are less world-changing. Why don't people play high-level stuff as often? And specifically, it got me thinking, well, D&D obviously is a progression game where you start at level one and you can get all the way to level 20. What does level 20 D&D look like? And then I thought we could just sort of talk a little bit about that and some of the examples of things that level 20 characters may fight in various forms. So I've got three books in front of me we're going to go through. So we've got the Dungeon Master's Guide. Specifically, I'm going to look at page 232, which is Boons, but also a few pages before that, just because I know Fiona hasn't prepared it, so I can get her to... (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I've also got the Mordekainen's Tome of Thos, as well as the Monster Manual. And we'll be looking at some of the monsters there because I think it'll be good to just... Have a little look at level 20 characters. Mm, yeah, and it's interesting. I too saw the same graph from D&D Beyond. And it's just interesting. And a lot of the games I've certainly played have only ever been in the single levels. I think certainly with um, the game that we play, uh, TBA Mondays, this is the first time I've ever actually gone into double figures in playing a game. And I more attribute that not necessarily to um, people enjoying lower levels. It's just the interest peters out and the people's schedules don't get, you know, don't align up or anything like that. So to sustain a campaign, it's also that sort of weird completionist thing about it as well, that, oh, we must start it at level one and then slowly get into it. And obviously the higher you up you get, obviously you can hit more things and more things can hit you. And yeah, I completely agree. Like I've discovered obviously since playing 
in Zerios, actually higher level stuff is really fun, stressful, but a lot of fun. And actually higher level play has a more interesting element for it. Maybe not so much for the social role play aspect per se, but definitely the combat of it is definitely much more meatier. And I, it's interesting, most people don't, oh, what we saw from that graph, not many people go into it. So. Yeah, especially what I define as the last quarter of the levels. I mean, it, 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 the book does divide the character progression in these games between four elements, effectively. You've got the first quarter where, I think it's levels one to five, the, the training levels, the levels where your characters are dealing with th uh, threats it describes as being on a town or village scale, effectively. Six to 10 or six to 11, that sort of range is the second chunk where you're dealing with, uh, I mean, e e each of your characters are, are heroes in their own right now. They are, they are well known. They can deal with things on maybe a city level or like, like, a, like a very localized level that is dealing with a lot of people. You've got 12 to 15 or 12 to 16, which is this third level where you're dealing with things that are on like a kingdom or national level of interest. And then 17 to 20 you get into this, what they call planar threat area, where you are literally dealing with the worst that D&D has to offer you. And yeah, you're right. I think once you get to level 17, characters probably have level nine spells or the abilities that are right at the top of the trees of whatever classes they're at. And it gets quite difficult to manage. I don't know if you've ever been in the situation where you're DMing like a dungeon with puzzles, for instance, and you've got, you know what all the puzzles do, you know what people have to do to activate the puzzles. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with high level people, they can do things that are so much more advanced and capable and world bending that as a DM, and definitely maybe as a player as well, you're having to think about all these things you can do. Mm -hmm. it, it begins to get quite difficult to think about. Because if you've got a party of four level 20 players and you're dealing with a dungeon and you know that at any point they can shift plane or wish that anything to come into existence, you need to really be on top of what's going on. Mm. Um, I think it's a different way of looking at it. I, I think you have to, you stop looking at the little detail as much and you have to look at the bigger picture. And I think it's quite fun, but yeah, it's just sort of encouraging people to give it a go really. Let's start then with the Dungeon Master's Guide. Let's talk about Epic Boons and the few pages before, which I don't believe was in the notes that I had to look at. <laughs> well, it kind of all okay, like sort of stacks together. The, the idea in D&D is that when you level up, you receive more abilities based on whatever class you're in. So most people stick to the same class. A lot of people will dip into, say, a rogue of a level and, and start mm -hmm. to multi-class. And then some crazy people will go for three or four different classes as they go along. But once you get to level 20, that's it. That's done. You are as powerful as your character can be. You've probably triggered the level 20 abilities of your particular class, or you've got as many levels that you've hit the capstone. That's it. Mm -hmm. And Deciding what a character gets after that point is quite tricky. You've probably got magical items through your nose. You've got gold that is more valuable than anything that the DM's guide can, can give you. What happens to characters after level 20? And the DM's guide actually from, I mean, I'm just having a look at this, this is page 227 onwards in the sort of other rewards category. Mm. It talks about a few different things that can be given to characters in order to give them a sense of reward where one wasn't necessarily available with, with character progression. Things like supernatural gifts, charms, blessings from deities, marks of prestige. Some of these are quite interesting, actually. There's, there's things like the supernatural gifts. You, you are so powerful and you have done such good work that a patron, a deity, a god, a pact being, whatever this thing is, gives you abilities that are beyond the, the scope of your, of your character, effectively. And there are things that are quite simple, like a blessing of health, which increases mm -hmm. your constitution by two, up to a maximum of 22. So this is the first sort of start thing where you can actually push a skill above 20, which is something you can't normally do. Things like um, giving you the ability to summon warriors of Valhalla. There, there are some interesting charms here, mm -hmm. like for instance, a charm of a slayer where you get to sort of essentially take on the mantle of a dragon or giant slayer for the next few days. Um, these are all things that can be tied into a story if you're doing a campaign where say you've had a 10 session arc where you've been defeating Strahd, for instance, a vampire your god could reward you or maybe you've broken into the layers of hell and you've dealt with some strong thing that has given you 
it's a bargain for its own life. It's given you a blessing of some kind. It's just interesting things. Marks of prestige are also an interesting one as well, because these aren't necessarily things that have to be incorporated into the high game levels. These can also be thrown in at lower levels. Interesting ones here, favors. Obviously, if you do somebody a favor, they will be able to give you something in return. So if you have a local guard, for instance, you've taken on a local crime syndicate and you have defeated them, the guards may give you a favor in kind Mm. for your thing. A medal, which gives you rewards, strongholds and titles. These are fun. These things are Mm. fun. Strongholds and titles. If you've got a world, play around with it. Give your characters a castle in the middle of the city or a parcel of land just outside the capital that now they have to look after. If you're looking for content beyond level 20, make them king, make them queen, make them the ruler of whatever sort of empire you have just saved mm. and watch them deal with that afterwards. It's, it's quite interesting, I yeah. think. Yeah, that is actually interesting, making them do life admin uh, that she's not necessarily entitled to the adventurer's <laughs> life. Yeah, I totally see that. No, no. It, it, like but, the bureaucracy. Yeah. Well, it, but it's true. Because like, like you said, like sh- at some point you get to level 20, which you, you think is like the, the peak as a player, but that's as high as they can go. And I've always thought in my head, it's interesting when I've played adventurers, obviously when I first started out, I was like, oh, well, they, they're the same age as me or younger. So you'd have adventurers who, and certainly on D&D streams, they're always like, super young like 18 or 19 like babies and now i'm trying to be more sort of like okay well maybe they're going to be older and i think with with this sort of progression as well you get to that point where obviously if you're level 20 for me that's like okay you've spent at least 10 years getting to the top of your game and now Mm. at some point like any good athlete or any good um, sports person you're going to retire and then what do you do you would then probably go into the profession of you know admin or but like yeah, yeah. you know it, it makes total sense you're not going to be adventuring forever because your life will probably give out your knees will probably definitely give out yeah. and you know it's it makes sense that you would retire back into an organization or be able to you know put your expertise elsewhere so i do quite like that you had these sort of more as a flavor things not necessarily like you are getting more and more powerful because i think well not in real life but in, in the fantasy setting because obviously people do age and stuff yeah. They they still age. They still like get to that point and then curve off like all sort of humanoid races do. Exactly. And yeah, it gives role playing opportunities. I mean, let's say your character is still 18 and you've gone for a campaign and over the course of a year, you've defeated all these things and you've progressed and suddenly now you're given a title. Is your character ready for it? Are you, ne- are you the next villain of the campaign that comes afterwards because your character is so powerful and so stupid mm. that they mock something up royally and then somebody has to come in and fix it? I always like these sort of things. And, and these are all sort of story things that you can bring in. They also work, I should point out as well, with all of the material that comes out of the pre-made adventures, like Curse of Strahd, I, I used as an example. What happens to Barovia once Strahd has been destroyed? Could maybe the castle be given to the reward as a reward to the players who defeat him um, because nobody else wants it? It's cursed, it's horrible, it's broken down and needs a huge amount of maintenance. Um, I, I don't know, I quite like it. Um, yeah, there's many, many flaws in that castle. <laughs> <laughs> there certainly right. are. But then towards the end of the chapter, we go into the section called Epic Boons, which mm-hmm. is... I think a really interesting one. Mm. Once a character gets to beyond level 20, how do you progress them? How do you make it interesting for people to still develop their characters where, for instance, if you're playing as a rogue, you've got every skill that a rogue can give you. How is it still interesting? How does the game still engage you? And Epic Boons are an example of a way of keeping players engaged. And it all, I mean, this book gives an example of being able to put it into an experience point system where you've got the experience to get to level 20, you continue to accumulate experience. So maybe your character can, can go with other characters that in other campaigns and, and still join in, especially in Adventures League sort of situations if people are allowed to do that sort of thing. It's a way of continuing a progression and making sure that you're still developing a character without actually necessarily getting more class skills. And it breaks it down into three chunks of which really there are these things called boons of which there is a whole page of them we can have a look at some of them Mm -hmm. and then some alternatives to them Mm -hmm. the alternatives are the easiest things to do this gives you the opportunity to every thirty thousand experience pick either a new feat provided the dm is happy that you've learned the new feat and there's all kinds of feats in the book of stuff you can get or an ability score improvement that takes your skill above 20 Mm -hmm. all the way in this case to 30 now if you ask anybody playing a game, especially, I mean, any, well, anybody playing a player, and you say, do you want to take your maximum, your, your primary stat above 20? Normally, 
they will be very happy and they will just go, yes, this is brilliant. This is awesome. <laughs> it's quite simple, but it makes somebody quite powerful and leads to a sense of, of power that goes beyond like a level 20 character normally would. I think for me, that, that that's an interesting thing. So I obviously again going back to our campaigns i much prefer taking feats because i feel that certain certain circumstances obviously yes i i could improve a ability score but where's the fun in always exceeding i always like the risk <laughs> I, I i know sometimes i roll really badly and i like it when i roll really badly because it's always at the wrong moment and i get <laughs> and i get stressed but it's the good kind of stress so i i, I do have feelings about like you know there's just a thing like that would be cool but I like that role play element that I can play around that I do have a failing and it's not, not necessarily, you know, it's a mixture of the dice roll, but also it's, it's, I always feel like, certainly looking at these boons, I was like, these are so cool. Mm. Why wouldn't I go for that? Why? I, I just feel like it adds something special. And like these boons as well, they're very different. Obviously, some apply to combat, some apply to spells, some are just, you know, other things. It's like the boon of fortitude, which your hit point is, a maximum is raised by 40. And I was like, that's really good. You don't yeah. need to worry about your constitution anymore. So it's, it's exactly. stuff like that. Yeah. I it says, that. As, as a rule, when you get one of these boons, you can't get the same boon twice unless it specifically tells you that you can. And normally that's because you can get something that's similar, but not quite the same. There's always a rule in D&D that it doesn't like you stacking things unnecessarily if you can help it. Different abilities all combine are fine, but things that stack are not normally sort of, you know, approved of but yeah the boon of fortitude is a great example of one that you just yeah maximum increase of 40 suddenly your level 20 character is getting pretty tough by that point maybe if you also got a feat of the tough feat as an example which would give you another 40 you start giving yourself constitution modifiers you could have a character with 300 hp fairly comfortably um especially actually if you're playing a barbarian is a good example actually if somebody you get to level 20 you get the plus four to the constitution at the level 20, which is insane. It's really, really powerful. And suddenly, yeah, your health just gets mad. Mm. Absolutely mad. There are all kinds of boons here. I mean, did any stick out to you as particular favorite ones that you liked? Yeah. I know that I've got a couple that I quite like. Really? Oh, well, for me, um, I'm always fond of a good name. So like uh, the boon of undetectability. I thought that was quite good. You just, you know, constant plus 10 bonus to dexterity stealth checks and can't be detected or targeted by divination magic, including scrying sensors. I mean, yeah. that's, that sounds useful, because if you are certainly, a, uh, let's say, you know, a level 20 character who's probably, you know, they destroyed a few worlds or saved a few worlds, you're probably going to be on someone's hit list. So that yeah. would be very helpful in that respect. Exactly. And you could also, you, you kind of throwing that into a campaign of saying, that this is, we were talking about blessings just before, about mm. like a deity gives you a blessing. If, if some sort of trickster god or undead god or evil god might want to sort of give you this boon, which is almost like a sort of supernatural gift that they bestow upon you, or maybe you've just transcended beyond your mortal form and you start to break into all these things. It's, I mean, there are some really simple ones. The Boon of High Magic is one where you just get another ninth level spell mm. slot, which is very fun if you like high level, like two wishes a day, for instance, would be something that you could do by that point. One I thought you would quite like, a Boon of Luck. Again, some mm. of these aren't necessarily as strong as others, but a Boon of Luck gives you effectively just another D10 to add to any role you want. So that's like an instant success on something that's really important. Say mm. you've got one shot to kill the dragon, at level 20, you're probably always going to make that shot. And again, um, that, that one's you can reset on a short rest, which I thought that's mm. really, really helpful. Because again, yeah, some of these ones you just always have, like the Fortitude one, the Higher Magic one, That those you just always have. But some of them do reset only on a short or long rest. So I was like, the, the Luck one on a short rest, I was like, that's really useful. As again, like I said, I really love getting a feat instead. And I think all of my characters to date have always gone for the Luck feat apart from one, just to be different. because normally you use the entirety of your luck in the first half an hour. I would like to point that out in any session. Usually because it's very important. (laughs) (laughs) One time it was a natural one of perception and I went, no, I'm going to re-roll it. And everyone's like, why? It's very important, I see. And then I got a natural 20 and it was important. So I... I, I, I feel I know. I feel it's I know. It's the time that makes everything worthwhile, definitely. But these boons can be essentially used to make to give your character some flavors. Obviously, there are combat ones, things that make you essentially automatically hit in combat with combat prowess. You've got mm-hmm. the peerless aim, which gives you the plus 20% bonus. 
boon of planar travel. Perhaps I you've developed a, like a Vernus, for instance. You've got a pact with a Vernus, and now you can flick between now as, as you like. Boon of speed, if you're a monk and you're not walking quite quick enough and you want like a 90 <laughs> feet movement or whatever ridiculous thing you can you get. You pop to the shops and back very quickly. Like. <laughs> exactly. And one I quite liked as well, because it sort of weirdly ties in quite well to something that we do in our campaign, which is Boon of the Stormborn, which is what? immune to the lightning and thunder damage and lets you use thunder wave as a spell yes it's, it's just stuff like that which is i think really really cool it, these are good examples of things you can throw you, you don't necessarily have to be level 20 although these are very powerful mm. um i would recommend not putting them on on under level 20 characters because you'll probably end up mixing around with the natural ability of what characters should be able to do or you might be able to take a skill away from somebody who should be able to do something really well mm. like if you give the boon of skill proficiency to the fighter of the party the rogue is going to sit there going oh that's a <laughs> but me <laughs> exactly to the whole thing and suddenly that's not going to be very fun and remember as well that you can give ability score improvements and, and feats as well that, that will help because yeah level 20 characters they need to be powerful and, and there are some reasons why your level 20 character needs to be powerful, Fiona. Really? Would you like to hear about some of them? Well, let me shut this book and open another. <laughs> <laughs> so which of the case studies are you planning to go through first? To give this a little bit of context, the way D&D works is it assumes you have a party of four players on average. I mean, it, it works out between three and five, works quite well in the rules. But it seems you've got four characters of the same level in a party, and it scales around that. So let's assume we've got a party of four level 20 players. You are playing a max level combat situation. Mm -hmm. D&D reckons, according to its tables, that a challenge rating 20 creature is a hard encounter for a party of four level 20 characters, okay. which means in theory, over the course of an adventuring day with two short rests and then a long rest at the end of that, they should be able to defeat approximately six or so of these hard encounters in the course of the day. So this is pretty bread and butter, right? You, mm -hmm. you should be pretty comfortable with this. Let's have a look at, uh, which book is this? Mordekainen's Tome of Thos, and specifically right. page 117, where we have the friendliest boik in the book, <laughs> that big cheesy grin that greets you from the top of the Oh, book. I think I know which one this is. Is yes. this the Astral Dreadnought? This is an Astral Dreadnought. Oh. So this was introduced at challenge rating 21. So this is just a little bit harder than a hard encounter, but still wraps up into that hard encounter category, being... I think 33,000 experience points. So if you are a party of four characters, you would expect to fight six of these in a day, one at a time. Mm. So keep that in mind. An astral dreadnought plagues the astral plane. They exist and always have existed and were created by a horrible evil god called Faristoon, who's the chain Faristoon. one. Um, Faristoon's been around D&D for as long as I can remember. Mm. Um, Faristoon hates everything, and specifically he hates people who like gods. As a chained god, a betrayer god himself, he is not happy that the other gods got away with being good and being out into the world. And he likes to kill followers of his gods so that the gods lose connection with mm. their own support and, and effectively start to fade away into nothingness. And, and to do this, he created these creatures that stalk the astral plane and stop people from essentially traveling to the outer planes and connecting with their gods. Astral dreadnoughts are essentially huge hoovers. It is the best way I can describe them. They are massive slug armored creatures with huge claws and one horrible eye that makes you question your own mortality when you gaze into it. There's always sort of lore around them, but we're going to talk about it from a sort of mechanics point of it. So mm -hmm. this is an astral dreadnought. You've got four level 20 characters. What, what do you reckon a level 20 party would look like? I mean, what sort of characters would you put in a party? Probably uh, a fighter or a barbarian of some yeah, kind? Fighter, at the front. Uh, yeah, fighter. Uh, you, got, you need to do someone with range, so maybe a ranger. Uh, someone that can deal magic and someone that's quick. So I think it's the original sort of D&D classic party i believe is there's always this sort of folklore that was originally based on the golden girls and their sort of different <laughs> things so i think fighter ranger a cleric of some sort yeah, and yeah. a rogue well rogue? <laughs> yeah mm. rogue wizard something like that would be yeah. absolutely fine mm. so at level 20 your characters are pretty capable a fighter can shoot four times in a turn for instance an action surge to get eight hits in 
A barbarian probably has 250 to 300 HP. Wizards can cast level 9 spells. Clerics can now cast things like Mass Heal, which I believe heals like 800 hit points in a single turn. Oh, really? Yeah, I did not know, I know that one. We, yeah, we've got some incredible spells. Um, Wish can obviously change the fabric of reality. Mm-hmm. So what, as a DM, you need to do is to give them encounters that say, I mean, an Astral Dreadnought, if we go through the stats of this thing, you can mm-hmm. see that this thing's really tough, but it's not invincible. Um, no. We've got armor class of 20. 20, yeah. Yeah. At level 20, I'm assuming, for instance, let's say your ranger has 20 dexterity. So Mm -hmm. they've got plus five to hit. They've got proficiency of plus six. Mm -hmm. That's plus 11 to hit. Mm -hmm. Probably plus two magic weapon at the very minimum. Yeah, for a long bow or something, yeah. Yeah, plus 13. Maybe the archery perk to give you the plus two to hit. So it's anywhere between plus 13 and plus 15 to hit. Mm. So you're hitting on three quarters of your attacks. Mm -hmm. probably even with armor class 20 so it's not particularly tough it's got 300 hp that's or 297 that's again pretty tough (laughs) that's frowned up (laughs) i mean you're level 11 barbarian how much do you reckon you've hit in a single turn as as, as the best turn you've done probably 50 60 uh yeah between that those currently yeah when when i remembered to use great weapon master yes exactly so even your level 11 character could probably dish out 50 you know 50 damage in a single turn so six turns you could floor an astro dreadnought so again it's it's not not the biggest no yeah Especially when you've got four characters coming, mm-hmm. it's it's got attacks. Um, obviously, it can it can attack three times, a bite, and two claws. Average out. I mean, it's got plus sixteen to hit, so it's probably going to hit on at mm. least three quarters of its attacks as well. Mm. I'm assuming characters don't have an AC of more than about nineteen or twenty by that level. Um, mm. Maybe shield spells and all kinds of things. So it's probably dishing out about fifty to sixty damage per turn. Mm-hmm. Again, not huge. If you imagine Aubrey again, your your level eleven barbarian to put it in extent, you could probably take two rounds maybe three rounds of, of constant damage at that sort of level it, it depends on how i feel yeah yeah it depends on how you feel <laughs> i don't want to take that much damage but yes i could if i wanted to so if you just if i were to sort of get a big room stick an astral dreadnought in it and then have four level 20 characters fight it it mm. would lose really really quickly especially if you let the party fight in its own environment mm-hmm. so what you've got to think at level 20 is how do i make the combat more interesting and how do i make the enemies intelligent how do i make it seem that the monsters know what they're doing which is mm-hmm. the phrase that we always sort of put and that's where we start to look at the abilities and how do we put that in it's got a fly speed of 80 feet mm. this thing is pretty quick it can move around it's pretty nimble with lots of health and lots of ac it can move around without really fearing attacks of opportunity too much. We've got legendary resistances and some, you know, the saving throws aren't very great, but the legendary resistances stop the characters from defeating it in the first term with spells like banishment or mm. kinds of weird stuff that are going on along those lines. It has an anti-magic cone. Yes. Which is really interesting. So it projects mm. this 150 foot cone in front of it that stops all spells from functioning. Combine that with the 80 feet of fly speed, you can always maneuver your dreadnoughts, but it's always got every single spellcaster in range at every single point. That will nullify half the party immediately Mm -hmm. and begin to make things quite interesting. You've got legendary actions. Don't forget to use those. Legendary actions are really important at high level combat because they are the way that you continue to make the monster unpredictable. Legendary actions, I mean, this one, for instance, has got a teleportation in in terms of it can banish a member of the party, but it's also then got attacks of its own. It can't move about, so the Dreadnought is effectively just doing damage in order to get rid of party members. Mm -hmm. So fly it up, get all those spellcasters in range, and then start just wheeling on whichever one is the the easiest target. Can you swallow the wizard, for instance, Mm. at the start? Can you swallow the fighter? to sort of get them out or, or the cleric it instinctually knows the spellcasters and, and want to, to nullify them clerics and wizards are going to have a hard time if they can't heal or cast fireballs because you know um, yeah and i think exactly. the, the other thing that i thought was interesting again so you kind of mentioned it in sort of passing there so this creature can't be banished from the astral plane which is this home so that's when you're more likely to hit yeah, on this yeah, yeah and the other thing about astral plane which we i think we have mentioned we've mentioned it before but not this specific thing but like obviously you go into the astral plane you are sort of projecting yourself and there's usually a sort of silver thread coming out of you connecting yeah. you to your body and here it can choose on a critical hit to sever that connection and as soon as you that it's done that you're dead essentially and that is such a powerful move because again it's like you said it's it's plus what 16 to to hit so it's going to hit yeah. most of the time as soon as it has that chance to score the critical 
of course it's going to take a chomp out of the magic casters and they're mm. gone and that it's quite terrifying actually it's quite a it scary is. move it is that's what gives level 20 combat a little bit of added edge because you've got all these powerful spells you can resurrect people if you need to you can wish people back into existence so the enemies need to have a little bit of bite in order to fight them this is really i mean i would describe an astral dreadnought as more of a random encounter i mean this is something mm-hmm. to keep your party busy and probably to kind of burn through spell slots a little bit it's, mm. it's really difficult it'll make a party think but it's not going to threaten their lives a hard encounter is something that means that you've got to use some resources to get rid of it but you know with power with tactics with a bit of luck it's not going to threaten the party you could even use it as an in random encounter or as it suggests in the book that sometimes and i this is the thing where i'm just like this this for me was something like i don't see how this would happen in my campaigns, because I'm definitely not that clever, <laughs> it says like villains could enslave them and use them for their own thing. And I'm just like, any villain of mine is definitely not smart enough or clever enough to enslave a creature like this because it is so powerful. Like you said, it is just mm. a hoover. It doesn't care or anything like that. But so to, again, that might be another way to incorporate it into your campaigns is that not just a random encounter, but the, the big bad, your big bad is actually a weakling and gets eaten by their own astral dreadnought. And then you have mm. to fight that. But it's, for me, that you need, again, like you said, level 20 anyway is something I would struggle. I think I would struggle with anyway, just to do the combat. So to then have this big story arc where, aha, all along, I've, I've got the biggest, baddest creature from the astral plane, you know, you got to come and get it. So it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it, but it's exactly. the way to do it, so... It is. Uh, the thing I would remember as well is keep an eye on the legendary reactions. Make sure you're always using those and make sure you've got a really good way of representing uh, where the battlefield is and where the characters are. The flight speed of 80 feet is going to be your, your friend and you always want to make sure that it's moving around continuously, making itself a real pain the more clever and more vicious you are in how you deal with this thing, the harder it's going to be. And as I say, if you if you were to put this into a corridor and just march it against four people, they're going to have a much easier time dealing with it than if it's in its home terrain, it can fly about, it can ambush, and it can just be a little bit, um, a little bit evil. And the other sort of unique thing, um, which again, I think you have mentioned, is this sort of ability to transport or swallow any creature and it just goes to a unique demiplane, yeah. which they can't escape from unless they have a wish spell or some other way of teleporting. But otherwise they could just be in this place. I imagine it to be almost like a room, like a cone room, just full of debris, of dead adventurers and stuff. Yeah. Breathable, but that's it. Like you could be there for days and days and days and... For eternity. Eternity and die. It's it's horrifying. We've all had days like that where you feel so (laughs) hungry that you're pretty sure your stomach is a demi-plane. But this literally is like another portal. I like that it mentions it doesn't need to eat, but it Mm. does anyway. Yes. I love that. (laughs) <laughs> I also like the fact you thought, oh, you had days like that where you want to eat everything. I thought, well, I've been eaten by an astral dreadnought. I mean, I've had that day today, right? Oh, so. yeah, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> typical. But an astral dreadnought is still only a hard encounter. Yeah. And it's, it, it's not really, I mean, at lower levels, it could be used as a big bad, but it's kind of a mindless eating machine. Mm-hmm. The next one we're going to look at is... Well, it really is an end of campaign character. So we're going to flick forward in the book to page 180. Um, and we're going to have a look at Zariel. Hello. So I, I just have down as like, you would like Zariel. I don't know. She just, yeah. I think, I feel like she ticks a lot of fear boxes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> D&D's original fallen angel. So Zariel rules the uh, Avernus, which is the first layer of the Nine Hells, and is a fallen angel who is just terrifyingly evil and likes to kill things. I mean, devils are riddled with contracts and rules and Zariel pretty much has given this first layer of hell to stop the demons coming in and to kill as many things as she can. And she is powerful. So we're jumping up now to a challenge 26 creature. Mm -hmm. And again, to put that into context, if four level 20 characters were to get into a group and fight Zariel one-on-one, this would be beyond a deadly encounter. This is an encounter that is harder than any four level 20s can deal with. She is designed as something that you are going to need help with, be it five or six allies or a clever plan to separate her and weaken her or stockpile of items using every single one of your spells in a single combat. This is like max level combat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And, and we've kind of got everything here. We have legendary actions, legendary resistances, 
and a lair as well, lair actions, yes, which is really fun. And as a DM, you've got to kind of get your head around all these things because in order to make Zariel tough and really powerful, you've kind of use all of these things at once and make sure that you're kind of doing it. Again, there are some similarities with the Astral Dreadnought. The flight speed of 150 feet is, yeah really really quick and she's also got a legendary action where she can teleport um another 120 feet three times a turn so she can travel i think i'd have to work it up at like 660 feet in a single turn if she like, needed to who needs to go that fast i've got to be honest when you find out more about zari you think oh, that's pretty fast and then she's got all this other stuff you're like well, she should just walk everywhere it's totally fine yeah exactly <laughs> so she can move quick and, and that can be used to pretty much eliminate plans the players have got in terms of using obstacles or using getaway vehicles or whatever it might be. Zariel will absolutely hunt you down. Um, <laughs> the lair actions are quite cool as well. So she can cast these images of people. Yes. But she likes to use your loved ones screaming and being tortured. But anything that causes a deep-rooted fear, how is a DC 26 wisdom saving for I thought you? That's terrifying, especially because <laughs> you, you're frightened for the illusion for a minute. And yeah, you can save after that. But just that image anyway of just seeing your character's loved one burning in front of you. And that's kind of a distracting thing in this fight, yeah. let's be honest. Yeah, exactly. Well, but with a DC 26, she is a character that you are unlikely to be able to save against. Only the highest level, most specifically attuned people with a with a with like an actual proficiency in that saving throw can even get hope to it. Even if you had a 20 stat, which gives you a plus five skill, but you're not proficient, you can't save against that. That's impossible to save. So... You've got to describe Zariel as being a creature that is so powerful, you will fail every throw against her. And you need to prepare for that. You need to have items for half damage, you need resistances, you need spells that are going to three you from things. You need to be able to get round her because she is going to hit you hard with yes. these effects. So, I like that being able to frighten one. That's quite fun. That gives lots of interesting things. I'll tell you, my, my favourite one she can do as her legendary accent is just look at something and it just combusts. And again, <laughs> that is a 26 wisdom saving throw not to set yourself on fire. That is, again, an incredibly cool image that someone could just turn to you and just tell you to be on fire and you are. That, I just thought, was really cool. And again, I think possibly one of the only devils to do this, and I, I'm sure you correct me if I'm wrong, regeneration, that she will regenerate unless she takes radiant damage, which mm. makes sense because obviously she's, well, she is now a devil. But yeah. that could be really frustrating if you can't touch her with any sort of radiant power and she's just healing up as she does drive by sort of sweeps and then telling you to set yourself on fire. Like, it's like, yeah. damn, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She is... She is horrifyingly tough. I love that immolating gaze. You're right. It is so, it's so like much fun. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a good range of spells as well. You need to be, think very carefully about the distance to the target and how many people she's going to hit because a fireball spell is not going to do anywhere near as much damage as her longsword, for instance. But if six people are stood right next to each other, a fireball spell might be a good way of toying with people. A finger of death, again, is not her most powerful thing, but she might use it just to toy with people. I think using the different status effects so frightening people as long as people can see the illusion for instance they have disadvantage of all attack rolls for instance so that makes Ariel even tougher again armor class 21 she's pretty tough but not unbeatable hit points of 580 she's, she's definitely a lot tougher than an astral dreadnought and puts it into context she's twice as tough um mm. The thing I love about her is that she is essentially an angel. Her stats read very similar to the most powerful angels, but just really evil. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if you've ever had a look at angels in the monster manual, but they have this thing where all of their weapons have an holy aura. So they do huge radiant damage on every hit. Oh. And she just does fire damage with every hit. So the longsword, she can only hit twice with a longsword, which again, it's not that much. 17 slashing damage on each hit. Again, not that much. Oh yes, plus 36 fire damage per yeah. hit. So she's doing up to 100 damage per turn, um, which is quite fun. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, that, yeah, what you've hit on actually just, just then when you're talking about it, the sort of layers, uh, I, I know from our own experience is that the one thing that always scuppers me is, oh damn, there's layer actions, oh, the environment's against us. Because yeah. this is the thing, like you don't need other people with the Zarya fight. Zarya is a bigger, tough, big bad on her own. So she doesn't need to have suddenly rushing of guards or other demons with, like, to make it even an even more impossible fight. But the lair itself, with it, when it has just uh, every 60 feet, just a you know 10-foot flame just gouges out, this, out of the ground. That's <laughs> great. 
cool. That's all right. Um, there's smoke within the, the nine miles up until like 500 feet from us. You can't clear it away with any sort of wind magic. Yeah, fine. Yep. Totally fine. It, uh, you know, and then, and then like you said, the screaming voices, just driving people mad as you go. It's like, yeah, this, exactly. this is all fine. <laughs> you, you've got to use all their skills and you've got to remember the flight speed of 150 feet to effectively make sure that she's never surrounded by people. She can teleport. She can move really quick. She's never going to fight all four people at once in physical combat. She's going to pick people off. She's going to move about. She's going to use her javelins. Again, there's only a 30 feet range and then 120 feet at disadvantage. But when you've got plus 16 to hit, you can have as much disadvantage as you want. You're probably going to hit. So she's going to hover at about 120 feet throwing javelins, teleporting around, not letting the fighters get close to her. If someone is using range, she's going to teleport right in front of them and stop them from doing that. She can alter self, make herself seem like members of the party, go invisible. Mm. There's all kinds of little bits and pieces. Magic resistance is one you need to remember as well. Having yes. saving throws against spells and other magical effects. Combined with her saving throws, I mean, plus 16 intelligence, plus wisdom is a, it's plus 16. Charisma's plus 18 with advantage on spells. She's going to pass. There's no way she's going to get hit by. There's no point casting suggestion on her. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, that, that's a real, real way to sort of muck up your days to be like, hey, just, you know, do whatever. And she's like, what did you just say? And then, yeah, yeah I mean, you're already, you're probably already dead, but if you're in the furnace anyway. Exactly. But, uh, the last thing to remember with her as well is that, and this is kind of a bit of a law thing, but if you are, you've got four level 20 characters that are fighting Zariel, yes, they probably have pissed her off royally, but she is intelligent enough, 26 intelligence and evil enough as in arc devil evil to look at the characters and think, do I want to be fighting these people or can I tempt them with a deal? Mm -hmm. Because she wants to make deals with the most powerful characters and she can offer everything up to including wishes. She is incredibly evil and powerful. So if the party's fighting her, can she stop the fight halfway through and offer them all of these things and trap them into these deals? And, you know, if, if, if a character was fighting her and she goes, I can give you 30 charisma, if you stop fighting me now and you become my servant. It's just interesting. Cool. I think it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, so I'm sure you've used this as well, Ryan, but there's a website called Cobalt Club. Um, so I just thought, I wonder what other 20, level 26 creatures are out there uh, from the source books. Turns out there's Ooh. only um, another two 26 and they are the Demigorgon and Orcus. So two yeah. demon lords. So that for me was interesting. Again, if I was trying to try something, do something different, is that the way I would describe it is like a Pokemon battle. It's definitely not that I do not wish to diminish Zariel, Orcus, or the Demigorgon by saying they're Pokemon. <laughs> but I can imagine if you wanted to test out something, that if someone was playing Zariel and then someone else was playing Orcus, for example, and then just battling it out, that could be quite interesting as well. Because again, you've got it slightly different because obviously with the demons, you have like the madness stuff. Yeah, it's just a lot more to it. So I thought that was quite interesting as well, just to see what other things would you compare Zariel to. Mm. Um, and then, I'm sure which you'll be about to go on to, there aren't any other higher levels. There's no 27, there's no 28, there's no 29 higher rating ones. There is a 30, though. Do you wanna, there is indeed. Do you talk? I'll, sh <laughs> I'll shut this book and I'll open the other book. The Monster Manual. Yeah, oh, back back to the Monster Manual, page 286, and we have got the Tarask. Now, the Tarask has been the most powerful thing in D&D &D for some time, short of gods. Um, and unlike a lot of the other powerful things, this thing is native to the material plane. So this thing will horrify your dreams. Um, yep. There's been different iterations of it. People can only kill them with wishes or miracles or um, <laughs> fulfilling ancient prophecies or only awakening them with ancient prophecies and cosmic orders and all these sort of things. But the thing you need to know about the Tarask is that he's the toughest thing in D&D &D and it lives to eat. It has no ranged attacks. It has no teleporting. It has no ability in any way to like, attack people that are far away from it. It moves. It moves very slowly. Its speed is 40 feet. So it's, again, it's not particularly quick. And it eats, and it eats, and it eats, and it eats. I mean, where do you want to start? Armor class 25. Yep. <laughs> so even for level 20 characters, this thing's getting tough. And I should say challenge rating 30, by the way. To put that in context, he is about 60 to 70% harder than Zariel. And Zariel is way more powerful and than level 20 is, characters. And that is insane, just to yeah. even think that. 
So oh. legendary boons are something that you need to really consider, actually, in terms of giving your characters an ability to fight this thing. 25 armor class, 676 hit points. It doesn't have regeneration. So with oh. hit points of that level, it can be killed. Whether or not it can be killed permanently is up to your discretion. Mm. The, the description definitely suggests that it can't unless, you know you do things it's got the usual legendary resistance legendary actions but the speed is only 40 feet this thing's not very quick it is just it is a bit a little bit like godzilla like it, it walks That's, i yeah. literally wrote that down as godzilla ish is yeah. in my notes <laughs> godzilla ish it, it, it stands on its hind legs like a bird and sort of waddles around with its huge tail what sets this thing apart is the sheer damage this thing can kick out. So multi-attack, you use the Frightful Presence first, which means that people are afraid of it. Not a very high DC, but it means that people are probably hitting at disadvantage. Mm -hmm. By the way, this thing is immune to non-magical damage. So villagers, city guards, armies, this thing can't touch it at all. Mm -hmm. um, totally useless. And then it attacks five times. It's got a bite, two claw attacks, horns, and a tail that does an average. And this is plus 19 to hit, so it's going to hit you. On every is, attack, yeah. On every oh. attack. It's going to do 36 average damage, 28 average damage twice, 32 average damage, 24 average damage. It's kicking, I mean, again, the maths I can't quite do in my head so quickly. It's about 150 to 160 damage per turn. Um, okay. Good to know. <laughs> legendary actions mean it can attack another three turns. So it's probably dishing in, okay, you know, in, a, in an excess of 200 damage to anyone up close to it. So you're thinking, oh, why would I get up close to it? That's that's ridiculously powerful. Like I would, I'm gonna hit this thing from from far afar. away. Yeah, yeah. Until you hit the reflective carapace. Um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that, that is. It's such a cool little paragraph. I shall read it out. So any time the Tarask is targeted by a magic missile spell, the spell by a magic missile spell, <laughs> a line spell, or a spell that requires a ranged attack roll, roll a d6. On a one to five, the Tarask is unaffected. On a six, the Tarask is unaffected, and the effect is reflected back at the caster as though it originated from the Tarask, turning the caster into the target. What? Like yeah. So <laughs> that gets worse and worse the more you read it. It seems bad, and then when you actually think about it, it's really bad. Magic missile, let's face it, you're level 20 characters, you're never going to be using a magic missile. It's, it's just not a thing. Um, but lion spells, I mean, that's quite a lot of spells use lion spells, like lightning bolt lightning. is a good example yeah. of one. But then you can get around it with maybe cone spells or column spells or, or other bits and pieces like that. There's different shapes. But any spell that requires a ranged attack roll, mm -hmm. and then you read it again, one to five that's unaffected, six, it's also unaffected. So basically it nullifies all spells. Yep. It is immune to spells, and sometimes it reflects them back at you. That's incredible. I mean, you've got a level nine wizard chucking, you know, horribly powerful disintegrate spells and all kinds of stuff like that. And then, nope. Yeah, nothing, nothing will, was going to stick. You've got to be very, like, very selective on your spell choice. Very, very clever. Ranged attacks are probably the only reliable thing you're going to get through on this creature. And again, it's not invincible. So as a DM, you've got to think about how are you going to put this thing into a combat that all of level 20 characters are going to enjoy. Because mm -hmm. if they just start peppering it with bows and then travel 40 feet away from it all the time so that it can't <laughs> catch up, it's going to be... Yeah, exactly. It's, it, is, it is defeatable. So Yeah, just, it's got tiny arms. That's what I think. <laughs> That's why it can't reach. <laughs> exactly. It's not very maneuverable. So you can't do the whole Zarya flying around and teleporting thing. Mm -hmm. What will it do? Well, can you put it approaching a city? so that the players can't pepper it and, and annoy it because it's just about to charge into a city and use its siege monster ability to destroy the walls in one turn and then destroy a single district of the city every 10 rounds as it just wanders through consuming things. Mm -hmm. That will put the fear of God in people mm -hmm. um, and make sure the characters really have to think about defeating it really quick and maybe the fighter will get close just in time for it to be swallowed. Swallowed, yep. Exactly. <laughs> it's not oh. a good monster, is it, unless it can swallow. <laughs> That's what I say all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of these three, obviously I've given them to you in order of like horrificness. Yeah. But which one are you most afraid of? Afraid of? I'm or afraid what of would you, all what of would them. you least like to, to come across? I think, uh, ultimately, I think Zariel, just because like you said, there, it just feels like there's no way... I'm just, and, and this is me just thinking about all the characters I've ever played. If they ever got up to level twenty, whether they died or not in the process, that's another thing. Mm. I, I generally don't think there's a way. 
I, I think this is the thing. Is there a way that I can damage this creature for one hit point? I feel, I, and it sounds stupid, I think I could have a chance with the Tarask. <laughs> one hit point of damage. Um, you reckon? I think, Even though it's immune to all non-magical damage. Yeah, I think, I, and okay, I'm, I'm using Aubrey as an example there. I think, okay. I, think, I think Aubrey could do one bit of damage on the Tarask, perhaps, perhaps. And that's the, obviously a barbarian who has a flying cape and a uh, magical great axe. But it's generally just stupid otherwise, because uh, I'm playing her. Um, <laughs> uh, Astral Dreadnought, oh, it's tricky. Because it's because it's just it's spell casters, the anti magic cone, isn't it? It's not yeah, necessarily spell but it effects. Would affect, it, uh, you know, it's anything with magical ability. It, it, it strips away the weave. So even things like cloaks of flying well, magical items, yeah, mm. they would probably stop working as well. So yeah, so all right, so then that that might be a little bit trickier, but I definitely a thousand percent would not want to face Zario, like and and it's I think it's been a thing when we read about the Blood War, when we read about the Angels of Demons and stuff, and uh, sorry, the Demons of Devils, and I think and that's the thing we've I've sort of discovered is that I love this sort of the story elements that you can get and the sort of choices you get to make, but it gets to that point where it's like okay, I can't piss about now. And I doesn't think I know that D and D you you can piss about, and that's if you want to have fun that way, that's totally fine. But you get so much more out of it if you take it seriously and actually try and think and try and solve stuff. Because, and like I say, I get very stressed about these things, but it's good stress because I'm thinking there must be an answer, and I have the key. It's somewhere in the stat sheet. I just need to roll the right thing yeah. and say the thing yeah, at the right yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So I think I I think it's Zariel is definitely the one. I think, to be honest, the whole of the Vernus sounds awful, and I would not like to visit anytime soon. So, um, but fair. yeah, I That's think sorry. What about you? The hell for what, you. Well, thank you. Uh, what about you, Ryan? Which would which one would you wouldn't want to throw at a party? How's yeah. that instead? Wouldn't want to throw at a party. Mm. Oh, you see, I would want to throw Zariel because I think uh, she's really fun. <laughs> I think the problem with Zariel is that she comes with a lot of baggage in terms of the world yeah. that she is in. Mm-hmm. Um, and how she would deal with that because you would find her in her lair, which has probably got thousands of, de- of, of, of devils in it. Um, yeah. I think there's something joyous about putting the Tarask into a campaign because it's just a good end of campaign. Here's something to try and destroy. Like it's it's really good fun. Um, mm. it, just, it just feel like a, well, this is it, guys. Like either they come back from this with the world broken or nobody comes back from this and the world is still broken. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, it, there's nothing left of this Exactly, land. exactly. And the last thing I'll say about all this as well is that obviously, apart from the Astral Dreadnought, the, the Zariel and the Tarask are so difficult that mm. level 20 characters are not supposed to be able to comfortably beat it. They are deadly encounters and horrifyingly deadly. So building it into a narrative and actually giving a bit of plot line as to why you're defeating it and then trying to plan for the combat will give it such an immense advantage. And you can use things like these epic boons to give your characters an ability to, you know, get an edge. Like if you know that you're fighting the Tarask and that you need to be able to throw these very powerful ranged weapons at it, maybe you would take the feat of unearing accuracy so that when you fire the one bestial bolt of death juice you've got the plus 20 to hit. Do you see what I mean? Like it's yeah. just something that will give you an edge and Epic Boons are a really good way of dealing with that. I think the other thing for me as well is that, again, like literally like what you said, it's like, yeah, you have to build the campaign, you have to build the combat around, you know, what you want to do. But also I think, and I know this probably sounds really obvious, but you wouldn't have Zariel and a Tarask in the same campaign. Uh, I feel like you have to choose one or the other, not because... Um, the players can't handle it in any way, but I just feel like there's no way to get it fit without it being shoehorned in, in some way. Mm-hmm. If you're looking at high level combat and you want to include it somewhere in your campaign, maybe not necessarily at the end, maybe you're just like, I want to refer to it, like a, a bit like the Mind Flayers, for example, if they're going to go off and discover the Mind Flayer thing, they can totally do that, but that's probably not wise, you know, because of, of all the sort of baggage that comes with that. So it's, it's it's one of the things where I would probably have to have a real think about how do I want this to end and build back from there. If I literally, if I was doing like, maybe, maybe that's something I need to start thinking about actually is doing like a, a level 20 one shot, which, mm. is, which is just the fight. Perhaps there's no lead up. There's no, people can just pick their stuff and then just go into it almost like a battle Royale style. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. But there is some high level DMD combat Ooh, for you to think about really good oh well i have now thought of it and <laughs> oh well will, will it ever happen fiona uh, we'll see uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. so what what have you been thinking of what's what's next on the the list of things so i had a thought 
because okay so we're looking at some different sort of monsters different and that they come from different planes and that's what we've been looking at different places different settings and stuff so i thought we've we've done monsters we've done like world stuff why don't we look at a class and as someone has recently got a new eberron book uh <laughs> And as I have a special, a little place in my heart for a gnome artificer, I thought we'd look at the artificer's class that is in the Eberron, the Rising of the Last War. Oh, so. that would be good. I'm looking forward to that. I, yeah. I, artificer has been a funny one for me. I can't quite picture where it fits in. So yeah, that would be yeah. cool. No worries. But yeah, it should be quite fun. And I get to talk a lot about gnomes and artificers. So hooray. <laughs> So Ryan, do you have anything you'd like to plug that is not necessarily killing uh, <laughs> high-level combat or anything like that? Anything? Well, else I'm glad you, you said high-level combat because oh, I was stuck. It was <laughs> you can find me on YouTube. We're um, TBA Mondays for our D and D stream. You can find me at Ursa Ryan, where I play lots of computer games and, and film myself. Um, I keep myself pretty busy that mm. way. Yeah. Good, good. I guess you keep yourself busy. I just, it's also I film myself was a, was one. I was like, you film yourself playing, so not just. just I should <laughs> specify that. Yeah, that's very important. <laughs> um, so I uh, I am Fiona. I don't know why I started that like that. I run a, what am I rolling? Which is a twice monthly RPG one shot podcast. That's going very well. Uh, I, I always say that it's going very well. Um, <laughs> not that you're, you know, in any way modest or. <laughs> if you know what I. The artist way at the end of this week said, you know, you've got to, if any negative core belief you have, you've got to turn it into a positive affirmation. So if you think you're a failure, you've got to say, no, you're not a failure. You're a success. <laughs> no so, one likes me or talks to me, but I have a lot of time to work on my creative <laughs> pursuits. That is exactly it. <laughs> so you've got to change it to be positive. So I love it. That's cool. So yeah, so you can find that uh, on the uh, what am i rolling website which is www.wairpodcast.com or on twitter and instagram at wair underscore podcast so there Wonderful. we go god you're always so prepared compared to me oh, i never know what to say well it's, it's good because obviously you can't see the video where i'm just uh, like grasping at straws in the air uh, trying to trying to do stuff so <laughs> excellent anyway until next time see you later i guess <laughs> see ya bye, bye.